My name is David Summerfleck. For over 20 years, I worked as a digital marketing agency project manager and consultant where I helped business owners go from failure and ruin to reinvesting profits. Now I'm interviewing other experts and professionals to find out what makes them tick and get their thoughts on how you can learn from their experiences and revitalize your life professionally and personally. We cover topics as wide ranging as digital marketing, business innovation, culture, global trends, and ways we can all better channel our creativity. So let's join the discussion. Hi, thank you for joining me for another episode of my podcast. My guest today is Ashley Nichols. Ashley brings more than 10 years of experience working with executives from the White House to Wall Street and beyond. As a technology consulting leader, Ashley's teams have supported a number of internationally facing government and multilateral clients, including the World Bank, the Department of State, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation. She is the author of How to Use Tech to Save the World, a conversational guide to changing the world. Tech to Save the World explores how everyday people, even those who don't consider themselves technology people or techies, can use modern tools that surround us to tackle some of our greatest challenges in development, conservation, and sustainability. Thank you for taking some time to speak with me today, Ashley. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm dying to learn more about your book and what you do. Uh, I'm a big, I don't know if fan is the right word, but I'll say a fan of Tesla and Buckminster Fuller. So when I saw the description of what you do and what you're trying to do as well, I think, I thought it was really, really interesting. So I'd really like to dig deep into it, try to understand more. So can you start with your education and experiential background that led you to where you are currently in your present role and then gave you a high comfort level with technology? Sure thing. So in terms of writing the book, I got an undergraduate degree in journalism with some experience in public relations, uh, went straight into a master's program for higher education administration where I worked with a lot of college students. And then after that kind of pivoted into government work where I went to work um, as a government consultant for the last eight, nine years or so um, in in DC. And what's interesting about that is that a lot of the consulting work is around technology. So even if you go in and you're not techno a te technology person, you de facto become a technology person over the over the span of time working um, in that space. And so what I found really interesting and the reason this all kind of culminated together with Tech to Save the World was in every step of my career, I've worked with a lot of young people or a lot of just mission driven people who are really passionate about something. You know, they care a lot about something and they want to make a difference in it, but they can't quite figure out how to get there or where to start. You know, and how Higher education, it was, you know, students studying engineering so they could go work at like a Tesla. Or in government, it was somebody who had joined government to like write policy, but really their job was to like write memos and get clearances, right? And then in consulting, it's, you know, folks who want to like streamline processes and make things better through technology, but it's a lot of like delivering new software as a service type of stuff. And all those things have value and are important, but they don't really scratch the itch for a lot of people of really helping them do something that they're passionate about. Um, so I was per personally passionate about you know making the world a better place and was in a very you know sad lonely dark place in October 2020 height of COVID we were all locked down um, and I was like god I just wish I could do anything to make a difference uh, and so I started researching all these technologies that were making a difference and at first tech to save the world was going to be about how technology was saving the world and then I quickly found that it's not it's people that are using technology and their experiences partnered with technology to actually make a difference. So that's how the book all came together. And that's an important distinction to make mm -hmm. because the, the car needs a driver. So what inspired you to write the actual book? So I, again, at the time I was feeling really down and very disconnected. Yeah. Uh, and I saw a press release come through 
from Accenture, which full disclosure, I do work at, um, but I saw it come through on the, on the you know, public side through like uh, newspapers and stuff, uh, that Accenture had worked on creating um, artificial intelligence to save coral reefs. They called it Project Coral. Um, and I am a scuba diver and love reefs and was immediately just fascinated. How do you use AI to save coral reefs? And so I read through that and I was like, man, I wish I could do stuff like that. Uh, and around the same time, I had been thinking about working on a side project. So I was like, well, what if I wrote about this kind of stuff? Um, and then later I got to interview the guy, the project manager for Project Coral and learn about how it had all come together and write about his story in the book. So that was a really great opportunity. So how is the book structured in, in so far as like a, I mean, is it multiple interviews? I haven't had time to read it yet. So is there different sections? Are there different sections? Are there sections on application? Is, is how to take certain lessons or, or what you would get from certain interviews? Can you kind of delve into that a little bit? Absolutely. So listen, my biggest frustration with books like this one is they're often either very technical or they're very motivational, but they don't tell you how to do it, right? And I've right. I've always been frustrated by that. So Tech to Save the World is divided into three parts. The first is the foundations of idealistic innovation, and that's really narrative. It breaks down the different principles that make idealistic innovation work through stories of people who have done it through modern inventors and innovators. Um, and so there's a narrative description and why those things, why their efforts were successful. So that's the first kind of inspiration chunk of the book. Uh, the middle portion is called the workshop and it, it is kind of um, a lot of different tools for folks who are new to this space. I mean, lots of people aren't comfortable with technology. Lots of people don't even know where to start. Um, many people aren't familiar with design thinking and those methodologies. So the workshop is kind of a, you know, take what you like, leave everything else section on a technology for dummies primer of here's different technology you can use, as well as d d design thinking 101 with exercises and team building um, tools you can use to bring folks together to solve a big problem. And then the last section is the blueprints uh, for different archetypes. Um, so one thing I found when I was writing this was people all come to this space or this idea with different levels of money and different you know, folks in their network and different levels of experience. So there were three archetypes I identified, which were the dreamers, so like college students or entrepreneurs, professionals, folks who work at a nonprofit or in a technology space already and have some resources, and then executives, you know, folks who have all the money, but none of the time. Um, and so there are blueprints of step-by-step -step guides for each of those archetypes as to how they could actually take a project from crazy idea through to implementation. There seems to be like, uh what you just described there's like an implementation roadblock and i'm not sure how to really break it down but i wanted to get your input on that because you brought that up if we look at the work of someone like buckminster fuller who came up with all these incredible ideas i mean really fantastic ones most of them were never really implemented so how do you take some of these really, really innovative concepts that could save so much uh, water, for example, or save so much electricity or preserve the environment and curb global warming, but they don't seem to be implemented by the corporations, mm -hmm. which is, you know, how do you bridge that divide logistically? Can you? Yeah, so I think you've raised kind of two different thoughts there. You know, one is how do you take an idea to a real living thing? Uh, and to answer that, the honest answer is failure, you know, iteration and failure. If you have an idea for something, prototype it, you know, get to minimum viable solution with the, you know, tools you have available and see what comes of it and test it and try it and talk to stakeholders who would need to use it and see if it would actually work and iterate upon it from there. I think a lot of folks get an idea and they envision it at like, you know, completely done, soup to nuts, very expensive, very fine, shiny product. Um, and oftentimes either they get there and it doesn't work or they don't feel like they have the resources and acumen to get to that point. So by starting small on, all right, we'll try this small thing and see what we can do and iterate on it. That's how everyone, that's everyone's entry point into trying these things and trying to take ideas into implementation. I think it was Edison who said, I didn't, you know, he tried a thousand times to make a light bulb. He didn't find, he, he only found, he found a thousand ways not to make a light bulb and he learned from every failure. Right, there were um, so many, many steps, absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
So there's that side. And then you, you mentioned corporations really implementing these things. I mean, look, the big challenge we have, I think, in the, in the business world is that money is always the driver, right? And I think a lot of idealistic concepts and ideas often get put to the side because they're not, there's not stakeholder value in there or there, or there's not money to be had there. But if we can tie, especially in the business world, idealism to, you know, money saving measures, time saving measures, you know, streamlining process measures, if we can tie things that are going to help with climate change and also help the bottom line, that's really where you'll start to see corporations lean in a lot more. But I think right now those two worlds are very divided because, you know, lots of nonprofits um, and other organizations are working on the idealism side and then corporations are working on the financial side. And until they bridge, we're going to keep struggling. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And it seems like it's a very common misconception that uh, nonprofit organizations and POs don't make money. They just reinvest it back into infrastructure. They just have a different f format for all intents and purposes. But the, the, it's it, absolutely it's where the rubber meets the road you have to first present it and like you said bring in investors and show them how it can make money but also save money now they're interested who do you think would be the ideal reader for your book who can benefit from reading it the most and then maybe would who would enjoy it the most if the two are the same or are they two separate types of readers yeah i think there are two separate types. So I, my method for writing, you know, you always get, just get a first draft down on paper. Yeah. My method for writing when I was first writing was to pretend I was at a happy hour talking to like a college senior or like just out of school, you know, if someone coming to me and saying, hey, do you have career advice at a happy hour? And like, what would I tell them? Um, and so I do think that one of the primary target audiences for this book are, you know, college students or folks who have just graduated from college who are trying to figure out, you know, now I have all this knowledge and all these interests and all these passions, what do I do with them? Um, so I think that's definitely one segment. And the other segment I think are, you know, professionals, you know, folks who have been in their career for a long time who are feeling like, you know, am I really making the world a better place by doing my day job? Or am I like, applying my my background and my interests in a way that is meaningful because i think especially with covid and, and the way the world is right now a lot of people are looking for opportunities to make a difference um and and to try and help but they don't even know where to start they don't even know what to help with you know they know i i'm passionate about the whales but like i can't do anything about that like you know you can and i think it's really it's technology lets us learn about these things and technology lets us make an impact. So I think leaning into that um, is a great opportunity for just general professionals. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There's so many people who are feel detached or powerless with what's going on in the world uh, right now. I mean, there's so many different forums on Reddit trying to help people going through different situations, whether they're entrepreneurs or nonprofits or individuals just struggling with depression. And um, let me ask you, you said earlier that I don't know if you, uh, it, I, you mentioned somewhere that all people are tech people even though many feel otherwise, could you share more about that? Because some people do seem to have technophobia, if there is such a thing. Yeah, and so one thing that I really enjoyed about writing this book was I got to dig into this a little bit. Um, there is an annual survey of American fear uh, done by, I believe, Chapman, Chapman University. Of American um, fear. American fear. And every year, this sociologist, um, the, his mm. name is Dr. Chris Bader, uh, gets together with his students and they write up the survey of American fear and they send it out and they say, okay, Americans, like, what's on your mind right now? What are you afraid mm. of? Uh, and technology, every time, comes out in the top 20, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, fear of, you know, fear of identity theft or general fear of technology tools. Um, fear of robots was one a few years ago. Uh, and so Dr. Bader has this really interesting theory that fear comes from a this interesting blend, especially when it comes to technology, of having reliance upon something that you do not understand, right? So like, I use my cell phone probably a thousand times a day. If I had to like fix it, I'd be hopeless. Like I go buy a new cell phone. I don't know how it works. I don't know how the internet, you know, when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, you know, we know how a car works. We can understand, but like something like technology can be so 
um, detached from what we actually understand and how it functions. Um, so that's why one of the reasons technology is really scary to people. But my argument is everybody is a tech person right now. I mean, listen, COVID happened and we all grabbed our laptops and our cell phones and we went home and we did, we went to school and we did our jobs and we figured it out. We figured out how to use technology to solve a problem. Now, the problem at the time was how do we feed our families, but we still did it. And I argue that that inherently makes us tech people. It's a different way to look at it. Uh, let me ask you, why, what, what do you see technology's impact on society overall as being? Do you see that as being positive or predominantly negative in the long run, let's say, you know, 50, 100 years from now? And to what extent do you feel social media in particular is positive or negative, given all the trolling and disinformation that, that's going on? Yeah, I think so I know that that's a two-part question or a it is. divergent path. Sorry technology's about that. Impact. No, you're fine. So I think technology's impact overall is going to be incredible. I think we are at a live at one of the most interesting points in human history. I mean, look, the from the time the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk to the time man was on the moon, it was a span of like 67 years. Like that amount of progress happened in such a small amount of time, and we are exponentially increasing that progress year over year. Um, there's this really interesting statistics that um, kind of like uh, your computer can only hold so much data, right? Like the world, the amount of data we as like a human society can hold is growing exponentially year over year. And so we're learning so much more uh, as we have a, uh, the ability to access and analyze and think through different types of data. And 5G is only going to make that even a, a larger phenomenon when you think about things like Internet of Things. So I think from a standpoint of human advancement and learning, I think technology has incredible, not even potential, it's going to do incredible things. It's going to change us. It already has changed mm -hmm. us. Now, has it changed us for the better? It's hard to say. I mean, I enjoy, you know, being having Google at my fingertips. I enjoy being able to pay my friends or, you know, uh, connect with a business across the country, right? But some, it has a negative effect on some other, on some people. And I think that it's one of those things that we have to think through for each of us, you know, what it means and, and how we value it in our lives. I think social media ties right into that. Um, you know, there, I, social media has definitely changed the culture and the way we communicate and the way um, we, we learn and interact. And I think one of the scary things is that it started to shift the way we perceive our own value in the world. Um, so I hesitate to say, but like when I look at social media, I, I, I don't have an Instagram, you know, I have a Facebook that I don't really post in because it did have a really negative effect on me when I was a younger woman, you know, being in social media all the time. So I do think it does have the psychological effects. And there's even things, there's studies now that show that, you know, we constantly get the dopamine rush from being on social media and yeah. we never you know, come down from it. So we're actually like training our brains to need more and more dopamine. So that is, of course, probably not a positive thing, right? But we can, I believe that as time progresses, we're going to find more balance, right? Like as technology becomes something that we are born into that is woven into the fabric of our lives, it's not going to be as um, detrimental as it is now for some people, is my hope. I have been told by other folks that I am very much an idealist, um, but I, I definitely think that society, that technology is going to do us more, more good than harm. I think, I think it's a very optimistic view um, for myself. I think it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle where people ad adapt and kind of evolve so that, but I, I love everything you're saying and I hope, I hope that that is the case. Let me ask you about, do, do you think that there are technology is evolving faster than humanity can accommodate as far as, you know, culturally, emotionally, you would probably think no. That is hard for me to answer because I think we're getting then into like types of technology. Like we talk about lack of understanding, like that is like, you know, AI thinking for itself. That is like very like high level technology that 
I'm not as familiar with. So right. I will say that, you know, I, I haven't seen anyone complaining that internet's getting faster. I haven't seen anyone complaining that they can carry all their music on their cell phone, stream all their music on their cell phone instead of on their Walkman, right? So I think things, you know, I think for the most part, technology has made our lives better. Now, as it continues at this exponential rate, I don't know, right? There, there may be some harm from it, but there has been some good from it. I mean, there's this hilarious, it's not hilarious, but there's this great story out of Japan where they found they, a study, they did a study and they found that bakeries that sold more, ba like more types of baked goods sold more baked goods overall. So bakeries started to have like 300 types of baked goods for sale every day. And when it took a human time to bring that in, it took ages for them to actually ring someone up. So someone developed an AI program where you could stick your pastries on the thing and it would look at them and say, here's your pastries, it's $5, thank you, have a nice day. And a cancer doctor saw this on television and was like, you know what bread looks like? Bread looks like cancer cells. And so he worked with the company to tweak the, system, the, tweak the algorithm to read for cancer cells instead. And now that algorithm can read, can look at some at somebody's information and identify cancer cells in a way that it used to take a doctor um, analysis to do. So I think things like that are really interesting and cool and are going to make our lives better and easier in like the next, you know, 5, 10, 20 years. It's already doing that. But where it's going to be in the next 100, I don't know that that's for me to say. Right. When you talk about idealistic innovation and innovation in general terms, does it were you able to find any commonalities amongst organizations or individuals who are more proficient in developing innovative uh, processes, procedures, items such as apps and software? Were there any commonalities that you found in your interviews and, and research? There, I found quite a few. Uh, the number one was that when I sat down to talk to somebody and I said, tell me about your technology, they'd immediately go into like, you know, here's the code, here's the, here's the way it works, you know, here's how we, you know, launch it from, you know, here's we uh, push, push the uh, release, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, and then I would say, so how'd you get into this? And their eyes would light up, right? I mean, every single person that I interviewed likely skewed by the types of things I was interviewing them with them about, um, they lit up when they talked about how they got there, you know, what gave them that idea, why they started working on that team in the first place. You know, everybody brought this passion and purpose towards the cause um, that kept them working on it and kept them involved, even if it wasn't something that was going to make a million dollars, even on the days that were long and were challenging and on the days that they failed, like it kept them working on it. That passion really drove them. And then there were another, a lot of other factors that we see that are common in innovation too, right? Um, iteration, you know, not being afraid to fail. Iteration is the number one best way to work towards the best solution for a problem. Um, solving the right problem. Uh, one of the biggest things we see in the technology world is as soon as an I, a solution is decided upon, folks focus on the problems of the solution rather than the problem they're trying to solve for itself. Mm. And they get totally spun up in trying to like, perfect the solution rather than going back to, are we really making sure this is solving the problem? Um, collaboration with other folks. One of the big things I harp on is that nobody has the same background experiences, passion, skills that you as an individual reader do. And if you combine that with three or four other people who bring other mixes as well, you have far more chance of a fire, higher likelihood of success and you're going to be far more creative. Um, and then listening to locals or stakeholders is huge. Um, the number of technology solutions that are created without actually talking to the people who would be impacted are far too many. Um, and they almost always fail. So I would say that those are really the big commonalities. And those are actually the, the first in, in the book. It's there. Those are the foundations of idealistic innovation. So the ones who got more done in terms of innovation were more open to sharing, more open to collaboration, more open to dialogue. Is that fair? Absolutely. And this is something we're not just seeing with things like startups. Um, we're also seeing it, in the, seeing it in the nonprofit world too. Nonprofits are starting to, you know, shift from focusing on their silo and trying to solve a problem by themselves to sharing data sets with other similarly minded nonprofits and their ability to make an impact by sharing information and data has been exponential. Yeah. When you selected people to interview for your book, how did you decide who you wanted to interview and what was the criteria? 
I just started Googling. I just started reading and watching YouTube videos. And if I saw something that I was like, that's really cool. I reached out to people and the number of people, I truly didn't expect half of them to get back to me. And so many people were excited to share their story with me. I got to talk to Fabian Cousteau. He's he's working on creating an underwater space station, which is so incredibly cool. Um, I talked to uh, two gentlemen who developed a very lifelike animatronic dolphin. Um, I chatted with a young man who worked with a worked at a hackathon to create a PTSD app um, that goes on a smartwatch for sufferers of PTSD. Um, mm. And truly, I found all these people just by like looking through social media and watching YouTube clips and saying, wow, I would love to learn more about that. I wonder if they'd talk to me. Uh, and most of them were happy to talk to me. So I was really lucky in that regard. Okay. In your mind, what what do you think would be the the top three most interesting people who you did interview for your book? So top one, I opened the book with her. Her name is Laura, Dr. Laurel Stachel. Uh, she's an obstetrician. I won't give away her entire story, but the short version is she was studying um, why women were dying giving birth in developing mm. countries. Um, and she found, she get she went, I think, believe to Nigeria to do a visit and to try and like, you know, figure out this problem. And the first night there, the power goes out. And they're like, oh yeah, this happens all the time. We don't have reliable power. And if a woman gives, begins to give birth in the dark, she's three times more likely to die in the night because they don't have those visual markers of she's in distress or the baby's in distress. Um, so she worked with her husband who happened to be a solar energy educator to create a solar powered suitcase that has um, medical grade lights in it and, med and other medical equipment. So they charge it during the day and they bring it in and if the power goes out, they just flip it on. And it has provided light millions of hours of light since its inception. Uh, Go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask you, basically, for technology to connect with people in the world and the people who feel disconnected from the world, mm -hmm. what would you say to people who are struggling right now, you know, being unemployed in the midst of COVID? I'm sure you know. I mean, there's a lot of businesses who are struggling right now. A lot of people are struggling just emotionally, just trying to wrap their heads around, you know, how do I do this? I have children I have to send to public schools and nobody knows which end is up. How do we, how do we bridge that divide where we feel positive about the future? We have technology that can make so much of an impact on people's lives and how they live. How do we kind of bridge those two seemingly separate ends, I guess. I think that's a really interesting question. And to be honest, I don't have a perfect answer. Um, you know, I will say, I think that we're at a, an interesting point right now where when COVID happened, technology was our only tether to each other. You know, when we were all at home for, for weeks or months and we didn't know when you know they said two weeks at the start and so everyone went home for two weeks right and we like zoom called and we thought it was like so like fun and unique and here we are a year and a half later still doing it um i think that it's one of those things of it is a really painful difficult time and it a lot of people are struggling and I, and I think a lot of people had to get savvy with things like technology when they weren't before just to be able to do their jobs or to send their kids to school um so all that to say i mean i don't think that tech is a silver bullet for anything. I think it has helped us connect and, and you know, tr not truly lose our minds and can disconnect from one another, through, disconnect with one another through um, the pandemic and some of the other difficulties we've had over the last couple of years. Um, but it's it's by no means a, a silver bullet. I don't I don't think. Now I will say, um, I think it does have the power to connect us with things that give us hope, right? That lift us up. Um, one of the people that the other people I was going to mention is a woman who runs an elephant reserve in Thailand, right? And she does that through social media and fundraising through social media. And I've seen folks who, you know, were down during the pandemic or, you know, got sent home from their job and they would log in and watch her elephant streams of retired elephants that have, you know, that were missing a leg or something and see them running around in the mountains of Thailand. And that gave them warmth and that gave them hope for better days. So I think that it's, it's one of those double-edged swords. Yeah, well, I think that's about as good as an answer as anybody could give. If people watching or listening want to 
get involved or do more or somehow be a part of something larger than themselves. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations? I have so many recommendations. So first, hit us, hit us with them. The more positivity, the better. I love it. Yeah. So if you're you know, college student, there's always, you know, universities, colleges, even community colleges have so many resources. You know, they have free access to databases. They have, you know, interest groups. They have, you know, uh, some of the some of the leading world experts on a topic are probably working at the school that you go to. Um, so if you're if you're there and you're interested in something, just see what resources you have available um, to you. As far as professionals go, um, I think it's really interesting depending on where you're at. You know, some places do have geographically, you know, located affinity groups. You have like animal lovers of, you know, the central Ohio region or things like that, that you, where you could find other like-minded people to connect with um, and start to like think about different ideas like this. Uh, for professionals, sometimes your companies uh, or your organ other organizations organizations have existing things. I, I work at Accenture and we have a ton of employee resource groups and opportunities to volunteer and we do hackathons for different um, causes. So really, if you're interested in this stuff or if you're interested in making a difference, of course, the internet, uh, social media is always a great resource, but there's also stuff all around us um, in person as well. Hackathons are a really fun one as well. So honestly, the the options are limitless and just to some what we call open source resource, which is just hitting up Google is really the best way to find what aligns with your interests and where you're at. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, if people want to uh, read your book, um, it, where is it available? Yeah, Tech to Save the World. It's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. I saw it on Books a Million today. Um, you can also visit techtosavetheworld.com and drop me a note if you have any questions. Um, my contact information is all throughout the book because I'm a big believer in if people get started on a project and they get stuck, they can reach out to me. Um, so yeah, the, there's a million ways to get a hold of it. And the ebook should never be more than, you know, a couple dollars. So it should be accessible to most folks. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you so much for your time, Ashley. I really appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in to the David Summerfleck podcast. If you would like to apply to be a guest on the podcast or would like to ask a question we may use in a future episode, please go to www.dms.blue slash podcast guest. Thanks again for tuning in and hope to meet you in the next episode.